Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, and obviously, as people continue to join us, um, they will they will be let into the event. Um, thank you all so much for being here with us this evening. Um, my name is Stephanie Foner, and I work on the Affinity and Domestic Engagement Team in the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern. We work really hard to bring you all events and programs just like this one that are really unique and special. Um, and I'm just very glad to see you all with us today. So first, just a couple housekeeping items. If you could please keep your microphones on mute just so we can ensure a good sound quality through the course of the presentation, that would be very appreciated. If you have any questions or are having any challenges during the course of the presentation, you can go ahead and put that in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on it. So you can either privately message me or if you have a question that's popped into your mind that is maybe for discussion, um, go ahead and put that in the chat box as well. Um, the speaking program will be about 35 to 40 minutes. Um, and then at the end, there will be time for a question and answer. At that point, please put your questions into the chat box and I will be reading them out loud for Howard today. Um, if you think that you might forget your question, you can go ahead and preemptively put it into the chat box. That is totally fine. Um, and we will get to it at the end of the presentation. So now I'm excited to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Howard Conyers. Originally from a small city of Manning, South Carolina, Dr. Howard Conyers has taken a path that simultaneously honors his roots and creates a unique way forward. He attended North Carolina a and State University for his undergraduate degree and then earned his MS and PhD in mechanical engineering from Duke University in 2009. After graduating, Howard became an aerospace engineer for NASA but it was not long before he ventured back to one of his childhood passions, barbecue. The descendant of farmers and barbecuing masters, he decided to dig deeper into the world of barbecue and found that black people had been erased from the history books. He felt obligated to tell the story. Howard plunged back into preparing barbecue and ultimately traveled around the world, sampling barbecue and gathering stories from pit masters all over. Howard spends his time delivering lectures and educating the masses about the history and craft that cultivated barbecue. And now I am thrilled to be turning the floor over to Howard. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Northeastern alum. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you this afternoon a little perspective on, I'm calling it the topic Black barbecue, but it's really the history of a Southern barbecue. And I know some of the chats and comments were talking about Central Texas barbecue. North Carolina barbecue. By the time this is said and done, I hope you have a greater sense of what barbecue is, what it was. And then you'll realize in a lot of the parts of the South, barbecue was once the same before it started going into the various regions. So um, we're gonna talk about that. And you also have to get a little taste of history to keep, help uh, ground this conversation. You can't really talk about barbecue without talking about American history. So that's where we're going. Thanks again for the invitation. Really appreciate it. So this here is a, just a pictorial representation of barbecue over the years. Uh, the top left shows a, what I say, what is barbecue to you? Barbecue to me, when I started cooking barbecue was whole hog barbecue. And we used to cook it using direct heat pits. A lot of pit masters, a lot of people today sit as the holy grail of barbecue, but really the holy grail of barbecue is whole animal cooking. It could have been a goat, lamb, sheep, cow, um, turkeys, chickens, whatever they had, but they would always hold animals because it was far on the table. Um, they started cooking them in a hole in the ground and not necessarily what people say. I don't like to talk about the technique, uh, but barbecue in the South and barbacoa is two different things. But uh, the application, and sometimes a lot of people get that confused. Barbacoa was in more in Texaco, Texas, the Mexican region, Mexico region of the country. Um, and so we have to really honor that as a separate contribution from the indigenous in those regions. But the top left shows a picture of enslaved Africans cooking barbecue in a pit in the ground. Um, top right, a family and 
individual in Brassfield, North Carolina, cooking pit cook barbecue. Then in the bottom left is uh, BJ Dennis cooking um, pit cook barbecue in a hole in the ground where I was showing them that art of cooking in that particular manner. And then the figure to the right was somebody that I was teaching to cook how, how to cook a whole cow. And I was teaching myself at the same time, as well as after we designed the actual pit to cook the whole cow, because that's a lot of weight to actually maneuver. So food for thought, um, I'm not gonna read over all these questions, but I, there's some of the things I hope you all ask yourself when you get this, get through this lecture. What, when we think about history, has all parts of the story has been told or has only been recorded from one point of view? How many people in this lecture have been, or in the audience has grown up in rural areas and particularly in Southern states? How do you define barbecue? A lot of, that's a lot of debated conversation, a lot of spirited conversations. So a lot of people, they take a lot of pride in barbecue, almost like politics and religion. So just one of those things is, is barely, uh, a lot, people have a lot of pride in their barbecue. And uh, some of y'all wanna know probably how long this tradition has been in America. And, and I'm gonna say it has been in America pre-America forming. So are these type traditions worth preserving? And does a product giver background plays a part in authenticity? Just so you get a little background on my qualifications, I've been, I could trace my barbecue lineage 90 plus years by names. Uh, but before that, the individuals who were cooking barbecue, the way I could trace my lineage went well into slavery. Uh, my family, where I grew up in South Carolina, moved less than seven miles from where they was enslaved at. I've been cooking whole hog barbecue since I was a child. I know I look kind of young, but I've been cooking it well over 34 years. Um, but the thing that I, I'm most proud of is in the past eight, eight or so years, I have done a lot of scholarly research as well as traveling around the country and the world to eat and taste and learn from people who cook meat in various techniques. Um, I'm currently serving a mentor with Kingsford Charcoal Preserve the Pit Initiative. And uh, in the past, I hosted and co-produced a past PBS show called Nourish. And uh, the figure to the right is a popular saying we used to do when we cook barbecue, we say pour the coals to it. And that means we were getting ready to add more heat to the pit to keep the cooking process moving, moving along in a speedy manner. I mean, I know sometimes you say cooking with gas, but cooking with gas and barbecue really are not the same thing, but I think that was a popular saying that we used to say like, just to speed up the process. And talking about barbecue, it's hard to delve into barbecue without understanding American history. And I think this is important to put this into context. Um, the reason I'm saying it's important to put it in context, a lot of times in America, we forget about Florida and the Spanish that was in Florida pre, uh, we always talk about 1619 with Jamestown, Virginia, but we don't talk about Florida and St. Augustine's Florida and the history of the Spanish in that region. And so because of that, uh, I think we leave out a part of the equation in the Spanish territories of Florida, they had enslaved Africans there as well as Jamestown, Virginia. So there's a little bit of, it's a convolution in where barbecue originally started, but what I will say is like, it has some cultures in there in the beginning. And I think we don't really know who all was there, but I think we all know there's some contributions from each group. But what I will say over a period of about 350, for the longest period of time is what we know in American soils, um, pre-colonial to America, the enslaved Africans was involved in the process. And the reason I put these two pictures at the top was, the picture to the left shows uh, smoking a meat tr tradition of, for preservation. They had whole fish. And you see that picture being used a lot. But you, when you translate that to cooking pit cook barbecue, that was in a hole in the ground and you had whole animals. And in this picture, they had pigs and cows, which was not fish. And so that's a totally different animal, totally different protein. And they smoking the meat using a live fire, whereas the figure to the right, they're using coals. And in evaluating, this history, I like to, sometimes when I talk about barbecue, I like to look at other sources to kind of help me conceptualize the history of America. And, and that's where I look at like a text from slavery to freedom by Dr. John Hope Franklin, where he gives a pretty in-depth history of just America. Um, the figure that I showed you on a previous slide really related to something looked similar to a bukin. And um, you found that tradition in all over the world, cooking meat over a, a, a suspended rack above ground using fire. But when you start thinking about the actual technique of cooking, uh, buccaneering, 
you it's hard to control the heat precisely if you had to cook and feed thousands of people with um, live fire. And the reason I realized that I went to Trinidad and I went into a remote village and this guy showed me how to practice the art of buchan, a uh, buchaneering. And he was cooking some live chickens, the bottom figures, some chicken over a suspended rack. It was, instead it was uh, on a steak bed, he actually had it uh, hanging from the top of his, um, I'm gonna call it a hut for the lack of a better word, but I don't know what he would call it, a shed or something. But I went and observed that tradition in Trinidad to kind of get a perspective of it. And that was not really practical to execute on a large scale plantation. But a lot of people like to say that is the origin of barbecue, but I don't think that's the origin of barbecue because you had cultures all around the globe who was cooking over suspended tree limbs, whether it was in Africa, where they was calling babate, you find it in South America, you find find it all over the world where people are cooking over these type structures. It just wasn't practical. And I, I'm bringing that from a point of practice because I was a pit master and I understand how to control fire uh, with cooking meat. So barbecue, why we celebrate? Barbecue is about fellowship. And the reason I said for whom, when barbecue was first being developed and practiced on what we call American soils in pre-colonial era, it was not always for the people who was actually doing the physical manual labor for cooking. The people who was actually cooking it, they didn't necessarily get to enjoy it, but they was doing it for certain holidays, whether it was the 4th of July, Christmas, political rallies, church anniversaries, homecoming. Well, church anniversaries, homecomings, and associations was something that came later. They used to have uh, these religious gatherings for the planters where they want to show their wealth. Um, then some of the, in the later years, you start seeing family reunions, maroon gatherings. But attendance for the first really three fellowship opportunities, I said four, but it was really three. They were documented, you could cook anywhere from a couple of hundreds of people to thousands of people. And when I think about that and you think about cooking, back during those time periods, you didn't have a commercial slaughtering operation to supply ribs or chicken wings solely for a barbecue. They had whole animals. And because of that, barbecue lends itself well for scaling up to feed that many people. You didn't have that many chickens to feed hundreds of thousands of people. And there's clear documentation that says some of these barbecues for political rallies were huge affairs and it was a very laborious task to carry out and execute over a two or three day period. Cause you had somebody who had to dig the pit which was that long trench in the ground that you saw in those early pictures. Then you had to have people who to gather the firewood. Um, so it was all hands on deck. Then you had to have other people to actually be involved with slaughtering the animal. So it was an all day it was a couple of day affair. And then when you, after you slaughtered an animal, the pit had to be ready, the wood had to be ready. And then it had to be somebody who could watch those animals being cooked over eight to 12 to 16 hour cooking process. And um, cooking meat like that, you didn't have refrigeration. So once they killed the animal, if it wasn't winter time, they had to go directly into cooking. So those are some things we always have to think about like barbecue always been farm to table. The conditions in which it was being practiced may not always been the best for all people. But the reality is it was always farm to table and always whole animals. Nothing went to waste. Origins of the term pit cook barbecue. Since I talked about the hole in the ground, the, earth, the, the word pit referred to a shallow grave. And that was what it was basically digging to cook this barbecue because they didn't have the fabricated metal pits that we have today or the um, sheet metal pits or fuel tanks, offset smokers that we have in Central Texas. They were using the things that they had. America wasn't growing as prevalent yet. So the things they really had to execute this product during that time frame was really tree limbs, the earth, wood, fire, meat, and seasonings and vinegar for the protein, for the barbecue sauce. Um, and other than that, they learned that cooking was best done using hardwoods. And I believe that is one of the things enslaved Africans definitely learned from the indigenous community in regards to cooking barbecue. Uh, when you think about the Spanish, the Spanish were, were the ones who brought the pigs to North America. And so we definitely have a lot to add to different cultures. Different people brought different things. And I, I always say diversity make things better, but we also need to honor people who significantly contributed to a lot of our cultures, the things we enjoy today. Um, and over time, 
this pit cooking process, it didn't just miraculously start it like this. And I, I have traveled a lot of different places around the globe, and I haven't seen anything that looked like this. I haven't seen any pictures look quite like this figure to the left with this man cooking in this trench. And what one is cool thing that me seeing this trench that you all may not recognize is this man, the, the black man to the left has a shovel in his hand. And then the white man is looking over. Well, what you see in this picture that may not be uncommon to the trained eye, they, there's a bridge to go across the pit. And the reason there's a bridge to go across the pit is because when they get ready to apply heat to the into the trench using the coals, they want to get to the other side of the pit without having to walk it all the way around. So they had a little bridge to go across. So that's a little cool tidbit that I thought about. I wanted to share with you on that. And in the very background, there is a uh, basically a chimney to uh, actually burn down wood in the embers. And so this particular bit picture here was actually a canopy. And underneath the canopy was this long trench. And they probably used this particular location to cook barbecue on a, a fairly re recent, a fairly frequent occasion. So uh, that is something about pit cook barbecue is basically like a shallow grave. And um, what my father told me who learned how to cook in a hole in the ground was wherever you decide to cook in a hole in the ground, if, if you became, that became your preferred spot, you will use that spot over and over again because it's easier to dig once you have dug up something once versus going back and break new ground. So they will use that, that location pretty frequently once they find that was that preferred spot to cook. Associated culture to barbecue. There's three things that uh, barbecue and we think about when we want to have barbecue. It's tied to farmers, black farmers, um, whether it was enslaved, sharecroppers, or free people. Um, the next culture we don't often think about is uh, we always think about white people uh, bootlegging, but you had black people who was bootlegging too. They was uh, moonshiners just as much as white people. They had a deep heritage of uh, making moonshine. Some people call it corn liquor. Some people call it stump hole. Some people call it stump. And so those are the names of the products that black people was making. I know we a lot of people talk about Uncle Nearest and him working with Jack Daniels, but you had a lot of black distillers in the American South, but it was commonly found in the woods of the American South. And then finally you had things, once you had the barbecue and once you had the liquor, or if people drinking a craft beer, um, as you know today, uh, they have to have some place to enjoy and they would go to a juke joint or some club, some hole in the wall. And so that, and when you know those hole in the walls, you have music. And so that kind of ties barbecue the food and music, they always went together. And it's not an uncommon parent relationship when you think about it. And so much culture that America joy, enjoys today came out of these racially oppressed systems in the juke joints. You won't have the jazz music and the things you have today or the variety of different music, blues without having the juke joint. So um, even though this, this presentation is on barbecue, I just want to bring up those related cultures associated with barbecue. Across the American South, you had pit cook barbecue. A lot of, there's a lot of misnomers about barbecue um, being different. Uh, I like Central Texas, I like Memphis, I like Tennessee. But at one point up to the 19th century, barbecue was all the same up until about Eastern Texas. The only thing that was a little bit different in Central Texas was barbacoa that I mentioned earlier, but from Virginia, all the way to East Texas, barbecue looked the same. And the reason barbecue looked the same is because in all of those regions, they had slavery. And so whether it was North Carolina, Alabama, Texas, or Georgia, all of those cooking in pits. And that's the reason I put these four pictures there just to give you a representative glimpse of some of those locations. How do I convince myself that barbecue actually translated in the heads and hearts of enslaved populations in the South? So as I study history, I also read a book called The Half Has Never Been Told about slavery and the making of American capitalism. When I saw that particular pitch, as I started looking at the archival images of American barbecue, I saw this image in this book and it talked about how the patterns of slavery happened in the American South. When I saw these pictures, I realized during that time period, these individuals didn't have the Googles, the YouTube, TikTok, these millions of books that we have available at our fingertips. They didn't have the World Wide Web or the internet. 
So the information that they was actually sharing had to travel in the heads of the individuals who was actually carrying these traditions. And on my barbecue tour, the pictures that I showed you previously in black and white, I realized when talking to some of the old pit masters in the American South, they had one thing in common and they was talking about how did they cook barbecue in a hole in the ground. And just like my father cooked in a hole in the ground, I realized that was a common tie. And all these individuals was in rural areas. They had an agricultural tie to the land and they were cooking whole animals. And that last whole animal they was cooking prevalently was whole hog barbecue. And the, the thing that, the, the last thing that solidified that combination is the use of a vinegar pepper based barbecue sauce. And I, and I love that Texas always say, oh, we, and we love no sauce. We don't need any sauce in Texas. But the basic rubs in Texas are actually applied, the ingredients for the basic rubs, whether it's salt and pepper for the brisket, was actually being carried through the vinegar. The vinegar was a carrier of those seasonings into the meat. And so, and some people said the vinegar helped ten tenderize. As I was growing up, some of the people used to say the vinegar used to help tenderize the meat. And some people used to say the vinegar used to help with high blood pressure. I'm not a medical doctor, but I have heard people used to say, they used to make this saying was, vinegar make the head, vinegar keep the head from swelling when you're eating all this pork. And that was something my family used to say and people in my community said, don't know if it was an old wife's tale or not, but that's, you do some things and you carry it forward just because that's what they always say. But again, I put a disclaimer, I don't know if that's any truth. Um, I'm just saying what they told me. <laughs> so that reason I said that barbecue went with slavery. This picture here uh, was taken in Louisiana. And I like this picture because what it uh, further confirmed, if you look at the bottom of this picture, and not the end of it, this picture was taken in the 1930s or 40s. You look at this earth, earth dug pit. And a lot of people in Louisiana, where I live in New Orleans, they say, oh, Louisiana didn't have a barbecue tradition. I say, well, how about this picture? This picture showed clearly a barbecue tradition that a Southern barbecue tradition. And so I love this picture a lot to kind of convince my New Orleans folks and Louisiana folks that uh, there's a barbecue tradition in Louisiana. And it looked pretty representative to what was saw all over the American South. So I think I talked about everything for a certain point. And I, I went to a tour, uh, I went to three states. I went to the last, on, in 2017 and 2018, on my journey to really understand American barbecue, I wanted to go to the last remaining whole hog barbecue joints in the country. And I wanted to go to the last black owned whole hog barbecue joints in the country because I want to talk to the, the old barbecue cooks who now known as pit masters, uh, what were their thoughts on barbecue based on some stories I have read over the years. And so I went to North Carolina, I went to Grady's Barbecue in North Carolina and Jack Cobb and Son in North Carolina. Uh, Jack Cobb and Son closed, but I went just before they closed and Mr. Grady, I hope he stay open sometime so I can go back and visit him this summer. In South Carolina, I went to three places. I went, one is Campbell's, uh, one is Scott's Barbecue, one is um, Rodney Scott's Barbecue. But at the time, Rodney Scott's Barbecue wasn't separated for the family yet. Um, I went to two other places. I know I, I talked about it in a Bon Appetit article, but I should have referenced it here. And the last place I went was uh, Marianne. I went to Jones Barbecue Diner in Marianna, Arkansas. In each of those places, they was cooking direct heat using embers from wood, hardwoods, cooking on cinder blocks and metal pits, and they all had a vinegar pepper based barbecue sauce. All these owners that I talked to was probably 70 years of age and older. And in the conversations I had, I asked one thing to each of those pit masters without ever met, meeting them before and I asked them, what was the hole in the ground? And uh, when they talked about the hole in the ground, they said it was the same thing you described. I had some pictures and like, this is the hole in the ground. This is how we used to cook barbecue, especially when we um, needed extra capacity during the ma major holidays. Like the 4th of July, Christmas are two major uh, Southern cooking barbecue holidays in this country, especially in the South. Uh, the 4th of July, we used to have a running joke saying hogs don't stand a chance. If hogs lived through the 4th of July, it was a chance they would live to the winter. But if they, they didn't make it through the winter, if they made it to the winter, they probably would live another six months because sometimes with slaughtering traditions in the South, that was commonly done during the coldest months, particularly winter. winter. 
Um, the last thing I want to say about barbecue cooks, and we now know them today as pit masters, that, no, that word was not a word that a lot of barbecue cooks in the past knew about. And it was twofold. That, that word came about because of the TV show called Pit Masters in the 90s. Um, also, if you think about it from a historical standpoint, a slave master would never call his barbecue cook a pit, a master or anything. Um, so that word is a newfound word. Um, I, I embrace it now. I go by it. I use it to honor those individuals who came before me who laid the groundwork and the framework and the foundation for what I practice in Southern Barbecue as well as telling their stories. Because they indeed was truly pit masters. I, I don't think anybody in the country who could, could, uh, who could cook what they did in their lifetime in the environment and conditions. Not many people. I mean, I went back through it, but the reason I went back through it is so I gained a firsthand perspective of what they went through is cooking barbecue in a hole in the ground. So these are some individuals on this tour that I have met that I thought they represent the last of a dying breed. I talked about Grady's, I talked about Jones Barbecue Diner, uh, Dean Conyers, family friend in my community, Campbell's Quick Stop with Mr. Francis Campbell. The figure to the right is my father and me, and I was cooking a hog for this uh, fundraiser called Hogs for the Cause in New Orleans, Louisiana, a big philanthropic organization. Uh, so we basically some of the last who cooked barbecue in this particular manner. And then you have a few more individuals. You have Jack Cobbins' son, Ryan and Ed Mitchell. You have Rodney Scott. Uh, he's, he's opening a spot in Atlanta, Georgia soon. He's in Charleston, South Carolina, Birmingham. He's on a Netflix documentary. Uh, he has a new book out. Uh, he's definitely one of the few of the last of the dying breed. Uh, Ryan and Ed Mitchell, uh, they do a lot of exciting stuff and I, I have a lot of respect for them. And one of my favorites on this page that you all don't get to talk to a lot or hear about is Miss Helen Turner in Brownsville, Tennessee. While she don't cook whole hogs, she cooks shoulders using the same type methods, using embers from oak wood and burn it down and put it underneath the shoulders. And they're talking with her She's a gem, she's an icon, and she she outwork any of these men on these pictures. She's a one-woman operation in Brownsville, Tennessee. Um, I have a lot of respect for her in her operation. So if you're ever near Nashville or Memphis, I think it may actually near Memphis, take that little 45 trip, 45 minute trip to Miss uh, Helen Turner, get a full pork sandwich and a barbecue bologna sandwich, and you can't go wrong. It'll probably be the cheapest sandwich you ever eaten, but um, not from not like from the quality and execution, but from the price point when you start thinking about what you're paying for a barbecue in the city. And the last place on this is called Hell's Half Acre in King Street, South Carolina, with Ricky Scott. And um, it's just phenomenal barbecue, but you don't really see a lot of people cooking whole hog barbecue like this. Rodney Scott is leading a resurgence. I know sometimes I cook it on occasion, but um I don't cook it a whole lot publicly anymore. I cook it like maybe once or twice a year. Um, with COVID, I haven't cooked really since COVID started. So maybe once COVID turn around, I'll get back into cooking on occasions when I get to educate. Uh, these individuals here, I would say represents the future of barbecue. While we had a lot of whole hog pit cooking, um, there's some individuals who we'll be working with in the Kingsford program, as well as some people I have met along the way that I see doing fantastic work in barbecue. Um, if anybody in Ocala, Florida, or near Ocala, Florida, Big Lee's Barbecue. If anybody in Atlanta, Georgia, I know uh, Rodney Scott previously, but to the bottom left is Brian Furman, and he's opening Brian Furman Barbecue. He used to have a place called Bees Crackling. Um, Charlotte Mar. Lane is in Oakland. Um, the Davises are in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But these are some of the future faces of barbecue that you will see. And so I just wanted to highlight those individuals today. And I think the bottom right figure is Rasheed Phillips. You've probably seen him on a Netflix series called American Barbecue. Enough about Southern barbecue. I gave y'all a good framework of Southern barbecue, but I want to give y'all a little thing about the regionalizations of barbecue that we see today. Up until most of the 19th century, barbecue was pretty much practiced in the same way, but it transformed and evolved as it moved from regions out of the South to um, farms out of the South to cities. And I love when Kansas City say, oh, we cook barbecue differently. 
the father of Kansas City Barbecue is Mr. Henry Perry, and he came from Shelbyville, Ten Shelby County, Tennessee. So he brought those old recipes that he learned in Shelby County to Kansas City. But what made Kansas City and places like Chicago special, as people start moving to cities, people start having access to slaughterhouses. And with those access to slaughterhouses, barbecue changed from whole animals to different cuts and different parts. Not necessarily the whole animal, whatever maybe was, I don't like to use leftover, but some of the things that maybe didn't get top dollar at the butcher or the whatever, they had to be sold somewhere. And these very enter enterprising entrepreneurs, African-Americans who were just coming out the rural South and they needed a job, they were creating their own opportunities. They was controlling their destiny. So they brought those Southern recipes, those Southern flavors, and they start using the techniques to cook those things, but they start cooking them in a lot faster manner. And while some people may not say that it was barbecue, but it, it is in its core, its roots, it's barbecue. When you, so you start thinking about Chicago, for example, you got Lim's Barbecue on the south side of Chicago. That barbecue came out of the Indian Nola village of Mississippi, uh, in, Indian Nola community of Mississippi, not really a village. So you see how barbecue has transformed once you get out the cities. Memphis, out of Memphis, Memphis wasn't a farming area, but it was in the south. But if you in the country versus in the city, your the number of people looks different. So you adapt some of the things you have to feed more people, feed the masses. And so the picture here is Mr. Henry Perry, uh, Lim's Barbecue, as well as a slaughter yard in Chicago, because those things really kind of transform urban barbecue and start with the urbanization, the regionalizations of barbecue. I didn't really didn't talk about Central Texas barbecue, and I know that probably was a question. But Central Texas barbecue, I believe some people like to call it hill country barbecue and Czech country barbecue. I think they there's a missing a part of that equation because the Czechs, they definitely were great with making sausages and um, the Polish, they were great people with sausages and things of that such. But actually the actual pits that they were using, those pits I believe moved over from East Texas because they were using direct heat pits. They were using something called a burn barrel type device that where they burn hardwood embers. And one popular example of that that you see today is Miss Tootsie Martinez, or maybe not saying that right, but Miss Tootsie is a famous, she, she, she uh, works at a restaurant called Snowden and she cooked great barbecue. But a, a lot of people, I don't think they look at the origins and look at the techniques of what they're actually cooking in that particular region when they're using post oak to cook the meat. Um, now, when you start talking about like uh, Central Texas, when you talk about Cruz, Black, Smitty's, and that indirect offset smokers type stuff, that's a little different technique, but that technique came later in the 1900s when you was above ground. You can't really do offset smoking until you get above ground. It's just physically impossible. And as an engineer, it's hard to see how smoking heat can rise and travel in the ground and up and do offset in the ground. I, unless you're gonna dig one sec one section really deep, but I don't think anybody gonna dig one section of the pit really deep to do offset smoking in the hole in the ground. So when you start having brick pits and metal pits due to advances in America, whether industrial revolution, the advances of steel, the pit evolution process evolved too. You went from hole in the ground to cinder blocks, to masonry bricks, thin metal, um, even things such as wars actually contributed to the American barbecue story. Uh, different technologies came out of world wars that uh, really helped fuel barbecue to go forward. For example, two technologies I will say really transformed barbecue is welding and the building and the ability to torch and cut metal using acetylene and oxygen when you're cutting metals. So, or brazing, as some people say, to put metals back together. So those kind of innovations really transformed barbecue and barbecue went right along with it. And you can make pits out of a variety of things. Um, and as time get, goes on, barbecue pits will go further and further with technology, whether it's PNID controllers, Bluetooth, made to monitor your barbecue from your, blue, from your smartphone. But there's something to be said about what happens if you lose power or electricity, can you go back and cook your product? Talked about the hole in the ground. It just looked like a little shallow grave. You put some rods in the ground. You put a piece of tin over the top and you can cook barbecue. You don't need any power for this type of cooking. You, what you need here is a big 
a big understanding of the art form. It's a craft and it's a labor of love. The picture to the left is the sketch that my father described of how he cooked in a hole in the ground. My father, we never took any pictures of us cooking barbecue growing up. So when I started back cooking barbecue in 20, about the 2013 timeframe publicly, I realized I had to start taking pictures and video to document some of these old practices because I know black and white pictures, they look trendy, they look cool, but people, when you have color technology, people would rather see color than black and white. Um, here's a cinder block pit. One of these pits was from uh, Jack Cobb and Son in North Carolina before it closed in Farmville, North Carolina. And that pit literally is almost like a pit that came up out the ground to the top left. And the top right was a pit that I, I made when I had to cook for a fundraiser in my backyard and I ran out of pits, metal pits. So I had some cinder blocks and I had a piece of cardboard and I fabricated a cinder block pit out of basically stacking them like Legos to cook some chicken. I think for that particular thing, I, I cooked three, three hogs in my backyard, 40 pounds of chicken. And I think I ran out of pits. <laughs> um, Here's some masonry pits, just so you see brick pits. One was at a fire station in North Carolina and the other one's at the pit house at Grady's Barbecue in Dudley, North Carolina. Uh, here's a refrigerator pit. I learned how to cook in an old gutted out refrigerator as a child. So um, it was an old international refrigerator to, with a rounded top. Uh, tin and glass, I put that in here because in Trinidad they asked me to cook barbecue and they didn't really have what I was accustomed to so I make I made a makeshift pit out of old table and I had some old roofing tin and I converted that to what I remember as a child because somebody used to cook on roofing tin, but we didn't let, we didn't put the roofing tin on fire because it can galvanize and you don't want the ions coming off that. But then the figure to the right is when people took barbecue traditions out of the South and they put them in the restaurants in the South side of Chicago and aquarium tank smokers. Those aquarium tank smokers were basically direct heat pits. But the thing about those aquarium tank smokers, they had a twofold purpose. They cooked the meat, but they also was a marketing tool. When you when you walk by the storefront and you see all that meat in the in the window, that's gonna draw you in. Of course, the smoke gonna draw you in, but nothing like a great piece of meat, like a rip tip or a hot link and the juice pouring out of it, making you hungry and you don't stop by and get something to eat if you got a little bit of money in your pocket. Um, these here are some metal fabricated pits. Uh, ones, all of these ones in this particular picture, my father either made or he uh, repurposed for some old fuel tanks. Uh, one from an old oil drum. The welted steel pits are one my father made and uh, we actually made a burn barrel from an old 55 gallon drum. And that's how we burn down wood embers to make, uh, burn down oak wood and hickory to make the embers to put underneath the animal. Um, this is probably one of my biggest barbecue feats. Uh, cooking a whole cow, um, probably about a 400, three or 400 pound animal. We designed and built the pit. My father built the pit. I don't take credit for that. My father built that pit. I designed it. He built it. I tested it. And then when we cooked the whole cow on it, it was able to rotate. And uh, that was my first time cooking a whole cow and the first time cooking on that pit. That, that was about a 20 to 24 hour cooking process, just so you all know. It's not, it's probably one of the best tasting meats that you will ever get though. I don't, I mean, if you love brisket, you're gonna love, if you love brisket and you love steak, how would describe cooking a whole cow and the taste of it? It's like tasting the best parts of every piece of steak you want in that animal on a cow in one or two bites. Uh, before you had hard, before you had charcoal, you had these embers, and this was just we, before you had a burn barrel in the middle. They used to take an old tree limb, a tree trunk, and stack wood in a certain manner, and you use the tree limb to actually keep the embers from separating from the wood fire. And you have the wood fire going over top of the tree limbs, and the embers drop over time, and you take those embers and fire underneath the animal. And that was how we used to supply the heat to cook whole animals when cooking barbecue. I mean, now we got charcoal from various companies, whether it's Kingsford, Green Egg, I mean, it just a lot, I mean, Royal Oak, but it really started with cooking down, it started from burning down wood, particularly hardwoods, not pine. You don't cook barbecue with pine or cypress or nothing like that. If anybody ever tell you that, I mean, I know in the Northeast, they cook salmon over some um, cedar planks, 
but you don't cook barbecue in the American South with no cedar or cypress or pine. Run quick, run fast, or somebody serve you barbecue cooked like that. I don't want it. I definitely don't want it. Um, basically, the burn barrel is a device that it basically separates the fire from the embers, and you build the fire by having a rack in the in the barrel, and the in the in the wood sits on top of the rack. And as the fire burns and the wood breaks down due to the just due to the national natural combustion, the embers fall and where I have my, I don't know if you see my cursor, but um, the embers fall and you take a shovel and you take those those same embers and put it underneath the animal. Burn barrel like advice is, it really doesn't take a burn barrel, but you could construct it out of anything. You just really want something to separate the, the wood fire from the embers as they drop. I don't use, I use lump coal, I don't use gas and electric. I understand there's a purpose for it, given where you're located at, but to get real barbecue that I'm accustomed to, I don't believe in gas or electric, but I know some people do it because it's safer and ease than where they're located at. Barbecue sauces, I know that's a spirited conversation. People like vinegar pepper base, that's an old barbecue sauce, the only thing that ain't North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, light tomato is in, South Carolina, heavy tomatoes in South Carolina, mustard base is in South Carolina. And I know people like to talk about Alabama. It has a white sauce, but it's really found in Kentucky too. Um, it's a very long cooking process. As I noticed earlier, I described earlier for cooking on plantation, the same thing. Barbecue size, they just as important as the, the meat itself. And some of the sides that we used to grow up cooking was sweet, of course, sweet tea. Barbecue rice and hash, whole cakes, cornbread of some sort. Um, okra and black eyed peas, or okra and crowder peas, okra and butter beans. Um, those is basically barbecue has always been farm to table in all aspects of it. This is just just saying barbecue is one of those dishes that I believe has has is uniquely defines America, and it probably should be America's uh, meat if not dish, because if bourbon is American spirit and it was created on American soil, barbecue, from what I could tell based on my research, it was created, created here on the United States um, in America. And I think it has a very special place in America. And I'm not saying that just because I'm my bias, I'm saying it based on the facts of the evidence of where it was in its places in history. So here's some reading. If anybody want to look at some of my favorite books I have read over the past few years, they're not all about barbecue. They're not all about history. Some about being about a millionaire next door, um, the color of law, understanding different things um, and how discrimination happens against black people, uh, the racial inequality in America. This is some of my favorite reading lists that I thought I would share with you. Um, so my future work, um, that future work is really not that important, but I work with a variety of different brands and corporations, whether it's the James Beard Foundation, Kingsford, a and North Carolina A&T, been in the New York Times, been on the cooking channel. But important for me is a lot of the work I do, it's not about me. I just want to authentically tell black and brown stories because I believe in telling black and brown stories. It's important for people to understand who we are as a people, not just black people, but Hispanic, Latinos, Anybody who contributed to the Americas, we know it. They need to tell their story and we need to be able to make it equitable for all people. That's important for me. So I do that through meaningful partnerships with different people. So that concludes this presentation. Um, if y'all have any questions and answers, I'll try to answer the best that I can, but hopefully I can share something that was different about barbecue in America that's probably not really told like I generally tell. I can tell it. Thank you so much um, for, for that overview and that presentation. Um, we already do have some questions in the chat box that I'm going to start with, but um, if folks want to um, continue thinking and put other questions in there, we will get to as many as we can um, today. So the first question up is, at the beginning of the presentation, Howard, you mentioned that um, your father talked about using the pit multiple times. Um, was this strictly for ease or does this impart some sort of flavor? Are there other reasons for reusing the pits? 
So my father told me when he was cooking, when he was starting out cooking in a hole in the ground, it was a, a ease. If you dig this pit and you cover it back up, it's easy to redig a uh, old pit versus a digging in a new ground. So it's more of an ease of location. He will cover it up after every cook. Mm. Well, this this next question might be a little a little sensitive. Um, but how is the best barbecue given its designation? Is it flavor? Is it texture? How do they determine what the best barbecue is? I'm gonna tell you. I think the best barbecue designation is a personal preference, and and every individual gonna have their own personal experience of what they consider the best. If your mama makes macaroni and cheese, your mama has probably the best macaroni and cheese more than likely than somebody else. And it's the same thing with barbecue. I don't think the best barbecue designation is a really good designation to go from because everybody gonna have a different taste palette. It's, it's no different than saying something is the best wine. Somebody may be a Chardonnay drinker. Somebody may be a Pinot Noir. So in the whiskey world, somebody may be a a bourbon drinker or somebody maybe a scotch drinker and which one you decide is best really is kind of a personal opinion. Okay. Um, so in talking about sides, um, do you know where potato salad originated or came from? It's a very popular barbecue side dish. <laughs> it, it is a very popular barbecue side dish. I haven't really explored where potato salad came from. What I'm gonna tell you though about potato salad I don't, it's not as old of a side as some of the ones I listed. And the reason I'm going to say that is when you think about, well, there's two kinds of potato salads. I grew up in a mayo-based potato salad world. And some people grew up in a mustard or like vinegar-based um, potato salad. If my mom, where I grew up in South Carolina, I can't speak for anybody else. If you had a mayonnaise-based potato salad. You couldn't put that potato salad and leave it out all day. It had to be kept cool in the refrigerator. So if you think about the origins of a barbecue, and I told you back in the 1600s or 1700s, they didn't have no refrigeration. So that doesn't, that's not really practical to serve because mayonnaise will make somebody sick with the eggs. But I don't know the origin of it. I really don't know the origin of it. But I don't think it's as old of a tradition as people like to give it credit for. Was there something specific um, in your life or that inspired you to start on this journey? Because it is such a divergent path from what you went to school for and what um, you were doing professionally. I mean, I'm still professionally practicing. I mean, I still do engineering. I love it. I mean, I love math and science. Um, but what triggered me to really dive back in this research and I, and I brought it up earlier about news and media and the size of the story. So I think it was like 2015, Fox News listed a list of America's most influential pit masters. And on that list of America's most influential pit masters, they didn't have any African-Americans. And a lot of the rebuttals that came out, they talked about African-Americans and enslaved people was created American barbecue. I didn't say, I didn't say it, but they said they, can, they, said they created or contributed significantly to the, cult, the culture. And when I looked at some of those images that came out in those stories, and I read some of the story, they, they looked like how I used to cook barbecue. And then I dig a little bit deeper and they talk about cooking in a hole in the ground. And I remember as a child, my father always said, everything I took, taught you all about cooking barbecue started in a hole in the ground. And, and I realized at that point and doing a little bit of research, my connection to barbecue went well into slavery without even knowing it. But I think it was never really well researched. And being a PhD, it's not good enough to say, um, being a PhD, it's not good enough just to say that you contributed something without any facts or antidotal evidence to back it up. So I want to take a scholarly approach, a semi-scholarly approach. I'm not doing an all academic approach. Semi-scholarly uh, approach to question or interrogate and investigate as well as experiment to uncover what I thought were the roots of American barbecue and give it back to the people who could, who contributed the most to it. When you are able to safely hit the road again, what is the first city or town or state that's on your list? When I'm safely able to, I need to get to upstate New York. I don't know, not upstate, I need to get to Manhattan somewhere, somewhere in Manhattan. 
I mean, but, so not uh, for barbecue then. <laughs> not for barbecue. I just like the energy of the space. Um, I like to visit the energy of the space so every so often, but primarily, I love just staying in the south. Okay. Um, have you worked with? Um, Oh, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm gonna butcher this. Um, Adrian Miller on Black Smoke. Does this is this ringing any? Yeah, Adrian Miller is writing a book on uh, black on African American contribution to barbecue. I have not worked with him personally on the book. Um, I offered to work with him on the book. Uh, he didn't reach, and so that's all I could do. I'm writing a book on barbecue myself. My my approach can probably be a little bit different than Adrian Miller. He's a talented writer. Uh, but he's from Denver, Colorado, and I'm from the Southern United States. And there's a, in sometimes in writing and experiences, when you lived in an environment where a culture was created, you have a different perspective. And research versus lived is two different things. And so I'm going to give her a perspective that you can't just research your way through this thing. You have to live it, you have to breathe it, and you have to also talk to individuals in a common language. Um, his book gonna be great. I mean, it's definitely gonna have some well research stories. But long story short, I didn't work with him on his book. I offered, he, I offered, and that's all I could do. But I did buy. I bought his book and Rodney Scott's book. I'm waiting for Adrian's book to come. I probably won't read it until I finish writing my book, um, just because I don't want to ruin my creative process and my thought processes, and I don't want to be tainted with other other information. And we have one. Last question that I think is a great ending point. Um, so you mentioned the future of barbecue um, and had a slide on on the the next phases of barbecue. What are they doing that's new and different, and where is barbecue headed? So I think what where barbecue is heading, um, the equipment is definitely changing. Um, there's a lot of innovation in the actual smokers, the pits, um, the flavors, the different cuts of meat that people are cooking with. A lot more chefs are getting involved and they're putting a chef hand into the barbecue traditions. I think barbecue is going through an exciting time. I think one of my most exciting times about barbecue is particularly as I'm watching is, well, we see barbecue is definitely taking a worldwide stage. American barbecue is going all over the world. I know Texas probably has the largest market share for its marketing. I'm not biased toward that, but I realize Texas has done a great job in marketing barbecue. Uh, I think the thing that I also is equally excited about is in this moment, uh, or based on the work, a lot of work that I have done over the years is making sure African-Americans get their credit in the barbecue equation. I don't think they have gotten the, the due respect over the years in uh, barbecue, as well as many other things they contributed to American culture. And so I think that's really important. And um, that's what I'm most excited about. Um, and I think with sharing those cultures with other people, other people, cultures will be recognizing the process, um, not just black people, brown people, everything. And I think that's uh, open the conversation of what people contribute to America through diversity and inclusion. So that's what I'm really excited about. And um, that's where I think barbecue is going. I think barbecue is definitely gonna be a, a trend and it's gonna trend upward, especially as because barbecue always go well with spirits and it always bring people together for fellowship. And hopefully the future holds plenty of opportunities for coming back together in fellowship. I, I uh, agree with that. I agree, <laughs> I, agree. Um, I hope so too. Yeah. So, um, so now I'd like to turn the floor over to our Atlanta alumni community leader, Teresa Rodriguez, um, just to share a minute or two about engaging with your local alumni network. Thanks, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. And Howard, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, very insightful <laughs> and made me hungry, of course. And I knew that was coming. <laughs> Um, uh, everyone, I'm also an alumni of Northeastern, graduated uh, class of 2001. Um, I moved from Boston down to Georgia about four years ago and I had the amazing opportunity of helping um, start up the alumni chapter down here. 
uh, for Georgia. So if you or another alumna that you know or any parents do live um, in Georgia and you're not signed up for the emails and you're not um, getting notification about our events, definitely reach, reach out to me. You can see my email address here on the screen or to Stephanie. Um, and we'll be happy to, to add you to our list. Um, yeah, as life starts getting back to normal, uh, we will gather again in person. We've had three events, if I'm not mistaken, by now <clears throat> in the last couple of years, primarily before COVID. And it's been amazing. Um, and uh, people are very excited that there's finally a chapter here in Georgia. So please feel free to reach out. Um, and we're, you know, we're here as a resource and, and here to support each other, not only professionally, but also, um, you know, in your personal relationships, um, if you're here from Boston or from another state. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all of you who joined us today. You will be getting a recording of this event, most likely sometime tomorrow, as well as a survey. And we would love to hear your feedback um, as we seek to continue to provide opportunities for engagement for our alumni network. Um, so have a good evening and hope to see you again soon.